Guys, welcome everyone. We are super excited tonight to have Father Conrad Murphy with us on the channel. Welcome, Father Conrad. For those of you who don't know, Father Conrad is a priest in the Diocese of Washington and is currently serving as a chaplain at the University of Maryland and is also the host of Catholic Bites. So welcome, Father Conrad. Thanks for having me, guys. So first, we wanted to just ask you a little bit uh, of your story. So tell our listeners why you're Catholic. Why I'm Catholic. I am Catholic because when I was four years old, I read the Summa Theologiae and I decided <laughs> to convert from Presbyterianism to Catholicism. Um, I'm Catholic. Uh, my, my, my mom uh, is Pres was Presbyterian. My dad was Catholic and I was baptized Presbyterian, but um, we became Catholic when I was four and um, grew up practicing the faith since then. And um, uh, so that, that may be the, 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 the proximate reason why, but the, the deeper reason why, of course, is because in the Catholic Church, that's where I've met Jesus Christ. And and that's the place I want to stay, the place where I want to be, that, that being with him and uh, receiving him in his sacraments and um, uh, getting to know him more intimately and deeply leads me to stay in this in this beautiful place. So uh, tell us about your, uh, to, to be able to meet Christ. Was that a, a single moment that you can remember? Was that kind of a, a process throughout your, your childhood into your teens? You know, it's a process, I think. Uh, I, I went to Catholic schools. I started falling in love with the Mass and altar serving and things like that, the Eucharist. And um, uh, got to know really good priests who kind of were an inspiration to me. And, and as I kind of grew in the faith, I, um, I, I it became more and more part of my life. And then in college, I really had a choice. I went to a very secular university and, and I realized that it's one thing or another. And I, I was like, okay, the Catholics are the people who seem like the most sane people on campus and they had free food. And I was like, okay, then I'm definitely gonna stay, stay with them. And uh, there I really learned how to pray. I really learned how to, how to really enter into that relationship uh, freely and to, to put my trust in the Lord. And when that happened, you know, I, I just found such great peace. And, and there were a couple moments uh, in college and then later in seminary where, you know, you really feel and, and experience the Lord's love. And um, I, one of them I'll just share real briefly is uh, um, I had a, uh, my senior year of college, I was at mass, I was an altar server and I, um, I looked at the priest and I thought, you know, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could be a priest. And I opened my heart just a little bit to the Lord. And, uh, and he really filled it with grace, like really powerful, tangible experience of joy that definitely didn't come from me. And it lasted for like a week and a half of just like real happiness and, and love for God and uh, almost like a puppy love for God. Like I was just, it was, it was gross and, and, and weird in a lot of ways. Um, uh, and, and so like there's just this certitude and this knowledge. And, and then that of course continues to grow and deepen because the Lord always deepens his, uh, his, his relationship with you as you go and, and it becomes more and more mature as you grow. So now as a college chaplain, do you offer free food? <laughs> not right now, uh, not because of COVID. <laughs> Um, so the college I went to, we modeled half of our, um, half of our programs off of the University of Maryland where I am now, like that we stole all our ideas for them. So like we had Tuesday night dinner when I was in college and that's because here at the Catholic Student Center, we have Wednesday night dinner and, uh, and that's a huge deal. I mean, right now we can't do it because of COVID restrictions and numbers restrictions, but last year they were getting 200 to 300 students a week at, for mass and, and Wednesday night dinner so much so that. Uh, we have to do renovation to to fit more space in here uh, because the, there's so many students going here. This is one of the one of the more Catholic colleges in Maryland, uh, believe it or not, and probably has more vocations than than even Catholic University does. So um, it's pretty it's a pretty cool place to be. That's awesome. Hi, although we will definitely pray for the ability for free food. We think that yeah, that exactly. is <laughs> an evangelization. Oh, yeah. It like whether it's college or young adults, that that is uh, such a, a critical good. I, I think we've brought more people to our Bible studies <laughs> through just offering food than <laughs> anything else. Seriously. So we, we set up we set up this uh, this year because we couldn't give out you know big quantities of food. We set up a room in the Catholic Student Center that we called the Snackristy, 
uh, that like had a bunch of prepackaged snacks that they could take and bring to their Bible studies and things like that. So we're still trying to give out the free food. Nice. Good, important. T touch a little bit on uh, how your ministry has changed with COVID. I know there's a lot of people who are stuck at home and um, it's just been such a crazy year in 2020. So uh, yeah, I'd love to know a little bit about what college ministry is like during COVID. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's unique, uh, but there are a lot fewer people here than, than we normally would have. And we're limited in terms of numbers of people who can come to mass. Right now, we're limited to 45 people in mass. But um, uh, the students are really clamoring for community and more so than than they were before, because they just lack that ability. They're not living in the dorms. They're they feel isolated. A lot of them are at home. And so our, our Bible study numbers have been growing. Um, over COVID. Um, we've got almost 30 Bible studies led by students on campus right now. And and a lot of those, uh, 75 to 80% of those meet over Zoom. And, uh, and they're continuing to build that community of faith and to pass on the faith, even though those students can't come here uh, to mass or can't come here for other things. But a lot of things remain the same. You know, there's still like people hanging out and asking the priest random questions and uh, still people yearning to go to adoration. And right now I, I just came from lighting a bonfire from, for one of our girls Bible studies. Um, they're hanging out and enjoying the last little day before Thanksgiving break. So um, a lot of the kind of standard college stuff is there. We just have to be creative and we can't do the big events, which normally draw people. Normally we do like a big pig roast. We do a big barbecue. We do all this stuff. So we told the students like, you guys have to be the CSC for people, the Catholic Student Center for people on this campus. I can't, I can't reach all these people now. I can only reach a small number every time we meet. And so you guys have to be the ones to evangelize. And they've really taken up the mantle to do that. And we have such great students and they're so on fire for the Lord. And they are bringing people in. Like, I don't, I don't have an ability to, to go out uh, because of the restrictions. And they, they do. And they, they bring people in, which is really awesome. I think that is a beautiful gift in COVID is taking on this personal responsibility for evangelization mm -hmm. instead of like looking at the priest and going, you're the leader and you are the total and complete uh, climax of the faith. And instead like, yes, you have the Eucharist and you have Scooby I want uh, to receive that uh, through your gifts. But the reality that we as the laity can lead people to Christ, that we can have these conversations, that we can do Bible studies in person or digital, uh, that that can be our leadership role uh, to bring to the church as well. And not only can, but must. Like we, yeah. we don't have the manpower. <laughs> um, and and this is the role of the lady. The role of the lady is to mediate Christ uh, through their, their baptismal priesthood. Like that's what my job is to do the sacramental work. It's your guys' job to do the evangelization. I mean, like that's that's my job is to to form and send people out to to, to go on mission. And uh, but there's not enough of me to go out on mission. I need all these kids, and thankfully the, these kids are, are are one much uh, much uh, more in tune with their peers than I am, and uh, and two are are such attractive witnesses like they really are and and they live lives of joy and they tell people that where that joy comes from and it comes from jesus christ which is just awesome that's so cool um, I, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I think uh what you said one food and then two challenging college students and young adults uh is such a good way to get them involved um, and to really have them step up and lead uh mm. is is a great experience for them uh but also just a great way for them to grow in their own faith as well. Yeah, to be encouraged through that. Uh, so one of the things that you do in addition though, uh, is run Catholic Bites. You're the host uh, of this podcast, which is a way that you can reach people in evangelization. Uh, and so can you tell us a little bit about what that podcast is, how it got started, how you got involved? Sure. So Catholic Bites was a podcast uh, for busy Catholics, as our tagline goes, and it's um, 10 to 15 minutes on some random topic on the faith. It started out um, with three of my friends in Rome, including uh, Father George, who you guys know, and or as we knew him back then, uh, GT, and uh, and then two others, Father Andy and Father Greg. And um, they had this idea. They, they, they saw podcasts growing and Kind of before the before it was cool and they're like we need to do something catechetical like this and so they, they did a really fantastic job 
doing a professional job of, of, of allowing people who are studying these different topics to, to give a, a catechetical discussion and, and, and a little bit of extra knowledge. And so I was one of the first episodes. I, I did a, something on Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, and that's how I got started. I, I thought it was such a cool idea, and I said, I want help, whatever you want me to do. And so they brought me back a couple of different times. And then um, when I came back from Rome, because this was all done in Rome, uh, they had me doing the 60 second podcast. And then I, I had an idea and I emailed Leslie, our, who kind of runs everything. And um, I said, you know, wouldn't it be cool? I've been listening to a lot of history podcasts. And I said, wouldn't it be cool to have a podcast on the history of the papacy, like every single pope? And uh, I was like, I'd love to do that. I think it'd be a total blast to kind of research and do. And I was looking for something to kind of like do for fun. And I thought that'd be a cool thing. And uh, so she said, yeah, sounds good. So we started um, about two and a half, three years ago. Um, actually, it was Thanksgiving. I remember because during my Thanksgiving meal prep with my family, I was like editing together the um, the intro music for our Habim Muspapam episode. So um, and so we, we started then and uh, we've been going through all the popes um, from Peter on. So that happens once a week. And then um, it so happened the guys who were still in Rome didn't really want to do the podcast anymore. And I was sitting with a couple of priest friends of mine, who uh, Father Alec and Father Chris, who are often on the podcast, and um, we were having just like a really random nerdy conversation that was a lot of fun and really interesting. And I was like, what if we just made this into a podcast? Like, what if we had just like a nerd out podcast <laughs> as part of Catholic Bites? And so again, I emailed Leslie and she was like, yeah, let's just, why don't you just take over Catholic Bites that way? And I was like, okay, sounds good. And so... We just got my friends together and our different friends in different places. And let's talk about like, what is the weirdest, nerdiest, most interesting thing about the faith to you right now? Like, what is the thing that you like read like four articles about on like Catholic encyclopedia and you think like, oh, this is so cool and no one knows about it. And um, and it, it's been really interesting, really fun. And um, people seem to like it, which is exciting. And uh, uh, more than just our parents uh, listen to it, which is like uh, the the metric that I use, and <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's been it's been a, a real blast to do. It's just a fun, great uh, way to um, to just tell people about like how exciting and how interesting and how how beautiful our faith is. That's a that's the same metric that we use for our YouTube channel. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, who is your favorite pope in all of that you've been studying? Well, I've only gotten through, I still have a hundred more popes to go uh, that I've written episodes for. So I can't give a definitive judgment right now. Um, I'm a big fan of Pope uh, Leo the Great and Pope Leo the 13th. I'm a big fan of uh, Gelasius the first and Gelasius the second, because it's a cool name and they were both cool popes. Um, Oh gosh, Urban the second and Victor the third, or Victor the second, maybe I can't remember which one he was, what number he was. Those were really awesome. like the reforming reforming popes in the Gregorian uh, Reformation uh, around the 11th century, which our podcast is just now kind of getting into, um, are super awesome. They're so cool. They're, like it was just a bunch of like like holy monks who reformed the church after the Dark Ages, and it was like ten of them. You know, like mm -hmm. ten guys who really believed in the faith and really wanted to see it flourish. And, and they inspired the entire church to bring about this, this new reformation of holiness. And, and those popes were so legit. They were really cool. So, um, so it's hard to choose. I mean, they're, they're a lot of fun. And every time I read about, like, I used to be, a, uh, not used to be, I still am a big fan of Pope Hormizdas because he has a weird Persian name and a, like a, um, he has a he 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 healed two schisms in the church, not one but two. Like, I mean, so like, there's some really cool popes out there um, that are weird and obscure that you've never heard of. You know, uh, like John Paul's awesome, but you know, like Hormizdas, I mean, he's pretty cool yeah. too. So, <laughs> really often go as far as our own memories, which I think is such yeah. a good aspect for you to bring in that history because you know we're like oh in the last five years this is where we've seen the struggle or this is where like the church is failing me but like we have to realize that it's lasted through two thousand years of multiple schisms in a single papal see yeah we well, you know there's there's this line in um in uh gk chesterton's biography of saint francis where he talks about 
how old the church was at the time of St. Francis. And we think of St. Francis as being like really a long time ago, right? You know, you're walking around with robes and like medieval, uh, uh, you know, medieval um, uh, Assisi. And, and yet, like, I haven't even gotten to St. Francis yet. And I've gone through over 170 popes. So, you know, like, it's, it's like, the church is really old and you don't realize it until you get through the, like those sections that are like the 800s that you never talk about in you know, <laughs> class, right? And, and, and like we've been through so much and it makes our modern problems and our modern scandals and things like that look so uh, pallid in comparison. They're still horrible. Like it's still, any scandal is horrible, but like the, the church has been through a lot. and. And so that's like one lesson this has been for me has been like, oh, my gosh, the Holy Spirit really is guiding this thing. And I do not have to worry about anything because there have been horrible popes in the past and like horrible time in the church. And Reformation came about through holiness and fidelity. It wasn't like it was, it was people who responded to the gospel and desired to live it out fully. And like that's so inspiring. And so like when you see scandal in the church now. You, there is something real that you can do to make a difference, which is to try and live out the gospel uh, with fervor. And that's what solved those problems in the past and will solve our problems in the future. Well, speaking of uh, living out the gospel in your life, we are big fans of uh, teaching people to build habits. Uh, so we've done an episode, a YouTube episode on that. But uh, whenever I meet someone like you, I really like to ask, what are some habits that uh, you've developed that help you grow in holiness, maybe just something in your daily routine that maybe our listeners uh, would be interested in? Well, you know, one of the things they drive into in the seminary is the necessity of prayer. And at first, you have to kind of like be really intentional and schedule it in, right? Like, I'm not used to praying an hour every day, and I need to just force myself to do it. And part of the time, the seminary kind of builds that into your schedule. But, but you eventually have to start choosing, especially when you go on vacation or, or you're, you're back at home visiting your parents, you know, you have to be really cognizant of that. <clears throat> and, and now kind of, you know, it's still not perfect, but like, that just is part of my day. Like, it's just a habitual part of my day and I can't live without it. And of course, like, I don't, I don't worry about missing my time in prayer because I know it's, it's got to happen, you know? And so I don't have to schedule it per se, but I, I know like, okay, this is what is, is, is a, a mainstay and a must before I go to bed I have to I have to have prayed and spent my time with the Lord and and when that fits in and different things like that becomes habitual as well so I guess that's that's one thing like having a habit of prayer like a, a, it becomes so a part of you because like right a habit is something it's a stable disposition to do the good you know so it's something that that becomes a part of who you are and enables you to live uh, beautifully and well and with creativity and and I think that's one of the things seminary kind of drove into me is that habit of um, of, of regular daily uh, prayer. I think that that's such an important thing that in both of our vocations, like that is something Drew and I just did a series on prayer and the importance. And it's just being drilled into me uh, all the more like you have to have a daily prayer life like that in and of itself is so critical to having a relationship with Christ and to be able to evangelize, to be able to to love like you cannot love what you do not know is kind of a teaching of saint thomas aquinas and this idea that regardless of our vocation regardless of if we are a priest or married or parents or single or young at all like it is a critical element and i think we have seen that grow over time like i'm not going to say it's been easy and that every day has been perfect uh but this reality we just had our third and both of us looked at each other and we said the biggest difference after the birth of our third was that it didn't knock our prayer life off mm. significantly like i just remember after our first we were like when do you pray like we were just like <laughs> overwhelmed and like everything was terrible and i'm like now i'm like oh, we have three and somehow like our habit just she kind of fell into that rhythm and to see that growth that it is possible uh, was a good 
be good this round. <laughs> so, so what what would you say to maybe a college student or a young adult or maybe a young mom who just heard like an hour of prayer, prayer and like their mind exploded <laughs> because there's no way they could do that. So, what what would you if someone came to you and asked about that? What would you say? So, I'm 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 a marathon runner, and uh, that's the same thing that people say when you say, "Oh yeah, you could you could totally run a marathon." Like they're like. What? No, I could never do that. You know, that's impossible. I hate it. And you can if you just start small and you you gradually continue going. And, and if you recognize what it is you're doing, like when you're training for a marathon, you you don't train. It's not about searching for that like runner's high to feel good, because if that was the case, you're not going to end up running because most of the time you don't feel great when you're doing that. And in fact, like today I had a long run and it was not a great run, but like you have to just kind of force yourself to go through it. And eventually you have those moments where you're like, oh, it was all worth it. You know, like when you cross the finish line in your first marathon, you're like, of course, you know, it was worth it. And even in the midst of it, you know, there are moments where you're running and you're like, yeah, this is great. I feel good. I'm, you know, I'm in shape and this is, I have this ability to do different things. And so it's the same thing with prayer. Like if you're going into prayer to like, to have a, a pleasant experience per se, like, like to feel really, really on fire or something like that. Uh, then you're not necessarily doing it for the right reason. You're doing it to run the race, and the race is a longer race than than just you know feeling good about things. There are going to be moments when you pray where it's going to be really hard and really dry and difficult, but those are the moments where you really grow and you really develop and it makes it easier for the next time. So you start small. You start with 15 minutes a day or 20 minutes a day, and you gradually build up, and you become very deliberate about it. Um, Romano Guardini has a book on prayer, and he says, you should force yourself to pray. You shouldn't just pray when you feel good. You need to force yourself to do it because it's the only way that's going to open your heart up to be able to receive the Lord. And sometimes um, it's going to look really dry and really difficult, but those are the moments where you, uh, where you really thrive. And so as you go, then it gets to the point where you're like, of course, yeah, of course I'm going to pray for an hour. You know, it's, it, it's what it is, you know. So, so gradually, gradually it comes about. So you just have to find the, find the time. I usually tell uh, spiritual directees, it's like, okay, I want you to go home and schedule exactly when you're going to pray for this whole week and then text me to let you, let me know that you've done it. Because uh, that usually forces them to actually like, okay, I'm going to actually do this this week. And that kind of consistency and, um, and the uh, uh, consistency and, and, and uh, accountability can really help help you uh, help you to grow in that way. We so I'll I'll share this little story with you. When when we lived in Germany, uh, Katie really wanted to run a marathon, uh, and so we were both working at the time. And so Katie had a schedule, and she um, would fall, you know do like little runs during the day and build mm -hmm. up you know each day of the week, and then on the weekends we do the long run. Well, um, I didn't do any of like the little runs. And then all of a sudden we just get to the weekend and she'd be like, all right, it's time to run like 13 miles. I'd be like, oh, oh no. So, needless to say, like we got to the marathon. It was not a super awesome experience for me. Katie really enjoyed it. She wants to run another one. Me, not so much. So I guess it just goes to show like the power of habits. If you just do that little by little every time, now that just becomes a disposition. Like you said, that becomes just part um, of your daily routine, and then you can work to have it enjoyable. Uh, but you don't do it because it's enjoyable. You do it because it's helping you grow. It's helping you make better. I I was reading a study, and it was just talking about this idea of do you truly love the Lord, and this reality of I am a person who like loves the consolations, like. Oh, my child sleeps through the night. Like I am in mass the next morning praying. <laughs> like that is totally and completely. And like Drew's kind of the person that likes suffering brings him to Jesus. Like he's like I'm having a really tough time. I like need you. Um, and so for me, when it's not a constellation, like realizing that I am still going to go there, and that am I willing to pray? Am I willing to spend time with the Lord because I love Him? even if I'm not getting a gift, you know, like if, do I love the gift or do I love the Lord and realizing that I want to go to prayer just for the Lord, not necessarily because of what he gave me. Or yeah, will exactly. me. yeah. Um, well, so if there were maybe some, one of your spiritual directees or someone that came to you asking for, Hey, do you have any resources on 
um, prayer. You know, at Catholic Link, we, we really like to provide resources for the new evangelization. So are there any good book recommendations or video series or obviously Catholic Bites podcast? <laughs> plug for there. Um, but I don't know. What, what would you suggest for, for people? So we did this year because we realized that prayer was going to have to be a big theme of our year with everyone so separate and disparate. We did a Bible study using Jacques Philippe's book, Time for God. I think that book is the easiest and best guide for how to pray. And it's short and it's simple, and yet every sentence is so deep and so powerful. So I would recommend that. I, I give that out like candy. In fact, we bought like, you know, hundreds of them to give to our students. And they it's been really beautiful. It helps, it's helped so many of them in, you know, very in, in very real and concrete ways to learn how to pray more deeply. So I think Jacques Philippe is really good. There's a couple others that are like um, kind of the classics, like uh, Louis Bouillet has the introduction to the spiritual life, and so does, um, I don't know, there's, there's a, a bunch of others that, along that same genre. I mentioned Romano, Romano Guardini and um, uh, a couple of, uh, trying to think of some others, like Difficulties in Mental Prayer by Don Eugene Boylan or um, uh, there's an, a, a number of books, basically. You can get all the books you want. And you just got to find the ones that kind of speak to you. I think for modern, busy people, Jacques Philippe is the best. And he's got a couple books on prayer. But that one, Time for God, is especially really, really good. Um, and then, yeah, I think it's helpful to meet with someone or to talk to someone that ha has done it before. You know, that it's not just kind of an intellectual exercise. But you'd like, oh, who who do I know in my life who really prays well? And how do I... How do I like learn from them and, and get mentored by them and, and and having a friend who's going through it with you? You know, maybe we're going to try and pray together. We have a group uh, uh, on our campus called Fight Club. It's a men's ministry uh, for men who are trying to to fight the, the addictions to pornography and masturbation. But it's also a group that has men learning to pray together. And it's incredibly successful, incredibly beautiful. Um, and th these guys are learning how to enter more deeply into prayer together. And it, that, that camarad camaraderie and fraternity helps them to like keep themselves motivated and to, to keep going. They've got their, their plans for how they're going to pray, their plans for how they're going to fight temptation. And it's like really awesome. And it helps free these guys to have a, a really fruitful relationship with the Lord and with, with women and with um, themselves. And so uh so having someone that's that can help you and then of course you know as you're growing in prayer it's always very helpful to have a spiritual director um to to help run things by and and, and kind of give you a little bit more insight into what the holy spirit might be doing in prayer uh, but i would start with jacques philippe i mean he father philippe is just amazing and i i didn't read anything by him until like last year and i can't believe it i was like how did i miss this it's so good. i always thought oh he's probably just some pop theologian kind of guy and then i, I read it and i was like oh my gosh every sentence is like taking my breath away it's fantastic so what so you said that you have uh, almost 30 bible studies on campus what uh what kind of uh, resources or topics are your students going through in their bible studies yeah, so we have um, we have Focus, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, and so we have five missionaries who help direct the Bible studies, and so they have lots of resources uh, on Focus's website of different Bible studies you can go through, and so they, they go through their kind of standard ones, and then we developed this Jacques Philippe um, Bible study for everyone to go through this year, because they all wanted something that they could do together, even though they're separate on different computers, they could all go through the same thing, so we developed that. Um, uh, for them this year but yeah they'll they'll they pray with the scripture and they they're different kind of uh things that focus provides that that helps them kind of start with the basic stories of salvation and the basic story of the cross and how to enter into that and 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 really help form them uh to to, to go more deeply in their faith we uh next question let's take it so uh we've met quite a few young adults that uh, were super involved in focus in their uh, college campus or maybe the Newman Center or whatever they had. Uh, and now all of a sudden they graduate and they get out into the real world. And um, now they find that it's tough to find a place in their parish. There's no other young adults that are around them. What do you give, uh, what kind of type of advice do you give to your seniors who are about to graduate and kind of head out um, into the parishes? Yeah, well, this is my first first year here, so I haven't done it yet. They haven't graduated yet, but I have worked with um, students in the past, um, 
so there's a couple things. One is you have to be intentional. And when you're in college, you can just kind of fall into something like this. There's free food. I go there. I just happen to hang out. All my friends happen to be Catholic. I, it just happens to kind of like, this is where I hang out. This is my, my place. And, and that's not, that's just like not feasible in, in the, the, the quote unquote adult, adult world. So, so you need, you need an intentionality, just like when you graduate from college or from high school, you only keep the friends really that you're really intentional about about maintaining. And so like there are a couple of friends of mine that when I graduated from college and I went to seminary, I was like, no, I need to call these people regularly because I want them to be a part of my life. And so you have to have an intentionality about it. You can't go into your life after college just kind of floating through things. And so that means looking for a place where you can have a community, where you can um, uh, be fed and, and you can uh, uh, continue to have that fraternity and that sorority that, that kind of helps build up uh, your own faith. But then the other thing is to, to be active. Um, that's one of the things that I think we pride ourselves on here is that like our students go into the parishes and they they like run a lot of stuff. Like my, my first assignment as a parish priest, uh, as a parochial vicar, like it was all University of Maryland grads who ran everything in the parish because they'd been used to having this deep relationship with the Lord and this life of faith and this vibrant community and they wanted to continue that. So do it. I think, you know, most priests are going to be like, yeah, do what you want. Like, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll hop on board whatever you, you have. And, and there's a parish down the street from me that um, they have this, where they have this really intentional uh, lay faithful and like the pastor doesn't have to do anything. Like they organize the rosary groups, they organize the men's group, they organize all this stuff because they just want it. They want, they're very intentional about it. And they intentionally live close to the church and they intentionally live together. And they intentionally go over to each other's houses and pray with each other. And and like, you can do that. Just seek out the people that you can, you know? And sometimes it's harder to find someone. So you gotta be willing to sacrifice and maybe drive a little further or or do something, but it's worth it um, to have that community. But okay, it comes down to that intentionality. Like, if you just if you go out there and just say, okay, it's just all going to get handed to me, then it's not, you know. And you're just going to kind of drift away slowly. But if you go out with a plan, like, okay, I'm going to find a place, I'm going to do something, I'm going to be with other people, you know, you might not get it right away, but at least you're going to be you're going to be on the road. I think that's man, such an important point. We found more and more in this ministry that intentionality is almost the first step to anything. Like if you want to grow in your prayer life, you have to be intentional about it. If you want to have a better marriage, you have to be intentional about it. If you want to try to raise your kids in the faith, you have to be intentional about it. And so that's, oh man, such a good point for young adults um, to just go out there and just, man, just don't sit. Well, I mean, start by sitting in the pews, yes, but <laughs> don't just sit in the pews, right? Yeah. And every, every priest that we've talked to, that we've gone up to and the, to have just, uh, excited, active, young adult, like priests are stoked to have that, <laughs> uh, you know, or, or any of the, the people who are running the parish. Uh, and so, man, I guess to add on to that, I would say too, that if you go to a parish and they don't have a young adults group, then that may be God calling you to build one, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and that's, it's so important uh, to, if you can, to build those habits um, in high school and in college. And those are things that you can really bring forward out into the parish. Yeah. And when it's something that does frustrate you, I think that that's a place where we get to look into our prayer and turn it and go, okay, this is something that does frustrate me that there's no young adult group. And I walk in the door, mm -hmm. God is working through that emotion to drive me to fill that gap. Uh, potentially. Yeah. And that's your discernment. And I, I think part of the, the thing about it is like, so often we just kind of go with the flow in our lives, but that's not necessarily really living to the fullest. And so having that intentionality enables you to say, no, I'm actually choosing the good in my life. I'm not just allowing myself to kind of drift from one thing to another. And and that leads to a much more fulfilled life. Even if you're not that successful, you at least, you know, sought to to do to do the best you could. And that 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 developing that habit of of actively living. Um, I think is so important. St. Irenaeus would say, I had the glory of God <laughs> and fully alive. And so how do we become fully alive? And I think through these habits, through 
uh, these resources that you've been talking about through this look at history, through this intentionality uh, as we go forth into our parishes and into our faith to step out on mission, as you said, like it's not just that we can, but that we must, um, and to be fully alive in that. Well, oh man, Father Conrad, thank you so much uh, for joining us on the channel. Uh, it's been super awesome to talk about uh, these topics with you, and we hope you have you back here. Uh, for all of our listeners, we will link uh, everything that we can that Father Conrad said, the books, <laughs> all the podcasts, um, everything, so that you guys can really grow in your faith, um, especially uh, during these times of kind of isolation. Um, but again, thank you so much, Father Conrad, for being on the on our channel. Yeah, thanks for having me. And if I could just make a plug, you can go to uh, catholicbytespodcast.com for our podcast. And uh, if you want to learn more about the University of Maryland Catholic Student Center, go to catholicterps.org. Uh, we always need support and prayers. So please, please pray for our students, especially. Awesome. Lovely. And uh, Father Conrad, do you think you could close us with a blessing? Sure. Uh, let's call down uh, the Holy Spirit. We ask him to enliven us and to bless us and to send his grace upon us. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you.